Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so before I jump into sort of the bulk of my talk today, uh, where I'm going to attempt to cover quite a bit of ground, I want to begin with a series of short vignettes, which are taken from my first night at a migrant shelter in southern Mexico. And as sort of an advanced warning, I'll be discussing some sensitive issues this afternoon. Uh, so that includes things like profanity, as well as a few uncomfortable scenarios. Uh, my point here is really not to shock anyone or offend anyone, but rather I really want to try and depict, however accurately that I can, the, the events and sort of wide-ranging experiences that occur along migrants' journeys from Central America. So with that kind of short advisory, I'd like to get started right away. So the dusty, unpaved road in front of the shelter was swallowed by darkness. As the yellow motorcycle taxi sped away, I approached the entrance with my belongings. Dozens of bodies strewn across the floor stared intently at an old flashing television in front of them. The shelter was a small dirt lot with one cinder block building standing in the middle. Long wooden sticks held up ragged tarps to provide cover from the summer rains. In the back of the shelter, an open fire flickered, throwing shadows against the cement wall behind it. Upon entering, everyone turned their head to look up at me. I set my possessions down and began speaking with Victor. Sitting on a broken folding chair held together by metal wires, we conversed quietly. Victor was from Honduras. He had escaped from MS-13 after they threatened to kill him and his family. Setting off from San Pedro Sula to seek protection in Mexico and eventually the US. Victor had lived in the shelter for two months, working as a day laborer in the nearby mango fields. He hoped to save enough money to smuggle himself across Mexico to Houston, Texas, where his sister and cousin lived. I asked him when he would be able to continue his journey. Only God knows, he replied. Moving forward toward the fluorescent light spilling out of the cinder block building, I overheard a muffled conversation between three young men. Did you hear? They found two dead bodies today by the railroad track, Salvadorians. No shit, one of the men responded. Yeah, both of them were naked, shot in the head. They took everything. The young man motioned with his fingers as if to shoot his friend. It's the ranchers, one of them replied. Out here, they'll kill you for no goddamn reason. As I reached the doorway of the building, a stray dog scurried past me with a leftover bone hanging out of its mouth. A group of young children ran after it, chasing the dog into the street. The building contained two small rooms, blanketed in dust with a number of extension cords snaking along the concrete floor. Connecting them was a narrow hallway with a plastic storage shelf, holding heaping bags of rice, black beans, and pasta. I entered one of the rooms and sat down after making brief introductions. Anna wore a tattered sling around her right arm improvised out of an old yellowed t-shirt. Red abrasions peeked out from the medical gauze wrapped around her hand and wrist. Traveling alone, she was sexually assaulted a few miles outside of town while crossing under the railroad track. It was Anna's sixth day in transit after leaving her abusive husband in Guatemala City. She refused to visit the medical clinic in the neighboring town, fearful that the staff might report her to immigration authorities. Anna insisted that she could make it to Mexico City, where her two sons had lived for nearly three years. After a long period of silence, she finally agreed to stay in the shelter and promised she would wait to resume her journey until she recovered from her injuries. In the distance, a train horn sounded, echoing off the cement walls of the shelter. The beast, everyone shouted in unison, pouring out into the street, we watched as the freight cars slowed to a plodding crawl. Catching my gaze, Armando exclaimed, three years ago, you could ride that train straight to the border. And now, I asked him, what happened? Armando smiled. Well, either the immigration authorities catch you or the gangs kill you. He laughed, shrugging to himself. But some of us still try. It's certainly better than walking. Slowly, he turned toward the shelter shuffling back as the rest of the group continued to stare at the train passing us by. So this series of vignettes from my field work in southern Mexico depicts a range of events and experiences that unfold along migrants' journeys from Central America. 
Every year, hundreds of thousands of migrants from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras risk their lives traveling northward, both to and toward the United States. Long before reaching the U.S.-Mexico border, however, migrants traverse thousands of miles across jungles, deserts, and sprawling urban centers in Mexico, frequently seeking refuge in migrant shelters scattered along the way. Whether traveling by foot or riding atop large freight trains, migrants spend weeks, months, and sometimes years in transit, encountering incredible dangers along the way, including assault, robbery, and in many cases, death. Physical hazards such as drowning, hypothermia, and dehydration are also common. Yet despite the importance of these journeys, scholars and policymakers alike have tended to focus on places of origin and destination. For example, in migration studies, there is a large body of work that examines sending conditions, settlement experiences, the impacts of migration on receiving communities, and so on. But as I'd like to argue today, spaces of transit and the places between places of origin and destination are just as important in making sense of international migration. And as I'll demonstrate, migrants' journeys and the act of transit itself are key in understanding the contemporary politics of mobility, as well as migrants' identity and sense of belonging. This is especially important as migration becomes increasingly fragmented and dangerous worldwide. Whether traveling across North Africa and the Mediterranean Sea to reach the European Union, or overland from South America and Central America to the United States. There is now a growing literature around these migration journeys called transit migrations. So with the remainder of my time, I'd like to structure my talk around the following few points. First, I'll begin by briefly describing the geopolitics of migration in North and Central America, including recent changes in migration patterns and immigration enforcement across the region. After that, I want to provide two specific examples of what looking between places of origin and destination look like, and perhaps more importantly, what this focus on the sites between spaces of origin and destination can tell us about migrants' mobility, identity, and sense of belonging. Here, I'll discuss the role of humor and laughter in migrants' journeys, as well as the significance of infrastructure, such as bridges and railways. Finally, I'll wrap up with some brief concluding thoughts, uh, certainly in time for some questions, I hope. And my plan then is to speak for roughly 40 minutes to leave ample space for discussion. Before we get there, however, a brief sort of note about methods. Uh, this work that I'm presenting today is part of a much larger project that draws on nearly 10 months of ethnographic field work I completed uh, in migrant shelters throughout Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States, particularly in Texas. There, I conducted interviews, focus groups, and in-depth participant observation, as I not only worked in shelters but also lived there, spending days and nights with participants. Over the course of my fieldwork, I was tasked with a variety of jobs, from processing paperwork for humanitarian visas and escorting migrants from shelter to shelter, to cooking and cleaning. And I'd be happy to discuss these methods further if there are any questions afterward, uh, but for the sake of time, I'll move forward. So in recent years, migration from Latin America to the United States has shifted dramatically. While rates of migration from Mexico have fallen to historic lows, out-migration from Central America, prompted by civil war, gang violence, and economic disparities, has risen to unprecedented highs. Currently, migration from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras represents the leading source of unauthorized migration to the United States, steadily outpacing any other region in the world. In response to this shift in migration, and for some time before it, the U.S. and Mexican governments have implemented rigid immigration controls, from policing and border security to interior enforcement operations. Within the U.S., this has entailed fortifying the U.S.-Mexico border through barriers and surveillance, as well as strengthening local policing operations far within the U.S. interior. A robust and growing industry of deportation and detention, often undertaken by private companies, has also expanded rapidly. 
In Mexico, however, efforts to restrict migration from Central America have been best encapsulated by Programa Frontera Sur, an enforcement initiative announced in 2014 by then-President Enrique Peña Nieto. With generous funding and foreign aid from the U.S. government, Mexico has deployed hundreds of new immigration agents to the south, particularly in states like Chiapas, Oaxaca, Tabasco, and Veracruz, as you see here essentially creating a sort of bottleneck at the country's narrowest point. The Mexican government has also made great use of immigration checkpoints, mobile kiosks, and new surveillance technologies over the past few years, ensnaring hundreds of thousands of migrants each year. In fact, Mexico now deports more Central American migrants than the United States, and together, more than 700,000 have been removed and deported by both governments since 2015. As this graphic shows, in just one year, from 2013 to 2014, when Programa Frontera Sur was implemented, detention and deportation of migrants riding atop trains rose 70%. In this way, the U.S. has sort of outsourced or externalized its immigration control. And contrary to public discourse here in the United States, it actually relies quite heavily on Mexico to do the majority of its so-called dirty work in controlling flows of migration from Latin America. And in this climate, migrants must undertake clandestine, often prolonged journeys across Me Mexico to reach the U.S. interior spending weeks, months, and even years in transit. Violence is not only frequent, but expected, as migrants become victim to extortion, kidnapping, sexual assault, and other forms of violence and brutality. As they attempt to evade deportation by traveling through remote areas, migrants also succumb to heat stroke, dehydration, and even animal bites. In response to these dangers and the risks of these journeys from Central America, Humanitarian groups and immigrant rights advocates have opened migrant shelters, places of aid and refuge scattered throughout Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. Shelters provide urgent assistance to migrants in transit, giving food, water, medical attention, and supplies. In addition, some shelters offer legal aid and counsel to migrants. While many are affiliated with religious institutions, particularly Catholic organizations, other shelters operate secularly or with local support. Migrants frequently stay in these spaces for days, if not weeks and even months before continuing their journeys. Despite their popularity, however, shelters often lack funding and resources, and many are unable to provide anything more than emergency assistance. Regardless, migrants depend on these shelters for support and safety. And because of this, these shelters are now key parts of migrants' experiences and out-migration from Central America. Thus, migrants' journeys and the sites between places of origin and destination are critical to understanding international migration and the contemporary politics of mobility where migrants spend increasing amounts of time in transit while navigating stringent immigration controls and other precarious conditions. But what can looking between places of origin and destination actually tell us about international migration? What can we learn from focusing on migrants' journeys and the act of transit itself? Here, I'll begin by discussing the role of humor in migrants' journeys. In particular, I want to show how joking and laughter actually represent a crucial yet neglected detail in migrants' journeys northward, which serve as a mechanism to cope with their vulnerability and as a source of shared solidarity between migrants, as they collectively join together to make light of their illegality and immobility in transit. Ultimately, joking and laughter in the spaces between origin and destination draws attention to migrants' identity, sense of belonging, and the complexity of their journeys. Please, everyone, help yourself to pizza. Don't be shy. Thank you so much. <laughs> so early one afternoon, I heard someone shout from across the dusty back lot of the migrant shelter, the train is coming. Everyone stopped what they were doing and sprinted toward the exit, spilling out onto the unpaved road in front of the shelter. 
Every few days, a large freight train passed through town on its way north toward the U.S.-Mexico border. In the past, migrants frequently rode atop these trains, traveling through Mexico to the U.S. in a matter of days. Recently, however, all they could do was stare as the train passed them by, likely headed through a number of immigration checkpoints meant to deter any passengers from riding further. In 2016, Mexican authorities began clamping down on migrants' use of the train, deporting anyone they found riding atop it. Standing in front of the shelter, we all looked off into the distance as the red and yellow freight cars slowed to a crawl. As the cloud of dust kicked up by the crowd settled, a group of four young migrants suddenly sprinted toward the train, pretending they were going to ride it. Wait, the four of them teased. Don't leave without us, they yelled toward the train's conductor. Everyone started to chuckle as the four men disappeared over the hill by the railroad tracks, knowing they would return once the stunt was over. A minute passed and everyone waited. Suddenly, the four men reappeared over the hill, screaming, acting as if they were being pursued by immigration agents. Run, everyone, run, they shouted in jest as they sprinted toward us. Laughter instantly erupted from the crowd, and moments later, everyone was howling in amusement. After a few minutes, the laughter dissolved, and with wry smiles, the crowd slowly filed back into the shelter, one by one. So the moment of play and laughter I just described represented a particular instance of humor that transpired during my research in southern Mexico. And far from the exception, these moments of joking and laughter were common, appearing in mundane conversations, everyday activities, and periods of general boredom. Migrants frequently invoked humor to joke and laugh about serious topics, in particular their illegality and immobility. In this specific example, the group of four migrants made light of their undocumented status by pretending to be pursued by immigration agents from the National Institute of Migration, or INM, which is the department responsible for immigration enforcement and policing in Mexico, very similar to Border Patrol, or ICE, in the United States. Migrants who travel through Mexico are often forced to evade these INM agents by running or hiding to avoid being deported. By imitating a familiar sequence of events, whereby migrants are confronted by immigration agents and must escape, the group of men poked fun at their own illegality and immobility, highlighting their undocumented status as migrants in transit. In doing so, they also exercised a subtle form of agency, subverting the authority of INM agents by mocking their actions openly in front of the crowd. Parody and ridicule destabilized, if only momentarily, the legitimacy of INM agents. This scenario draws attention to the delicate entanglement of power and resistance in transit, where migrants' use of humor represented an important, albeit restrained, political tactic for those operating at the margins. Roars of laughter from the crowd indicated that other migrants also participated in the joke. It is, of course, worth noting that the crowd laughed together, sharing a playful moment that underscored their collective status as undocumented migrants. These shared instances of joking and laughter contrasted sharply with the mundane and ordinary aspects of life in the shelter, which were permeated by boredom, monotony, and isolation. In the example I had just sort of talked about, Migrants joined together to laugh and make light of their shared illegality and immobility in transit, bonding over the men's clever stunt. Humor, therefore, represented a mechanism by which migrants negotiated their vulnerability while providing a shared source of solidarity between and among them as they joined together to collectively mock the conditions surrounding their journeys. Instances of humor also transpired outside of shelters. As migrants are caught by INM agents, they are frequently held in small, temporary detention facilities attached to INM offices, where they await deportation. Migrants often spend hours in these cramped detention cells before being loaded into passenger vans and deported to Guatemala. One day, as I exited this office, a familiar voice called out my name. Hey there, a migrant shouted from across the courtyard as he pushed his face up against the steel bars of his detention cell. 
Instantly, I recognized the man. He had stayed in the shelter for several days before apparently being apprehended by INM agents after continuing his journey northward. He was joined by a number of other migrants who somberly looked out from their cells. What happened? I asked him as I approached. They caught me last night. I tried running, but I was too slow, he exclaimed with disappointment. We chatted for a few minutes longer, and as I started to walk away, he quipped, Hey, when you come back here, bring me some dominoes. I'm bored. I bet I can still beat you from inside this cell. And you know what? I could really go for a sandwich. The food here tastes like shit. He stuck his tongue out in jest as the other migrants erupted in laughter. Us too, they all yelled. Chuckling to myself, I eventually said farewell as we parted ways. Despite being apprehended and detained by INM agents, the group of migrants still made light of their situation by joking about it. The man's comments were particularly funny because he described a set of circumstances that were completely incongruous with reality where bringing him dominoes and a sandwich was literally impossible. More importantly, his remarks pointed to the imbalance of power by purposefully making demands that were absurd and sarcastic, ordering me, a privileged American white researcher, to bring him items from behind the bars of his detention cell. This irony was not lost on his companions, who also laughed alongside him and enthusiastically declared us too. Their active participation in the joke marked a sharp contrast with the solemn moment before it, when they quietly looked out from the cell. This specific instance of humor created a shared space where migrants joined together, joking and laughing about their situation to cope with violence and insecurity. By making sarcastic demands and mocking the imbalance of power, migrants utilized humor to create a moment of shared solidarity between them, collectively acknowledging and making light of their immobility and imprisonment, as well as illegality and impending deportation. In these two brief examples then, humor was a key dimension of migrants' journeys, saturating their everyday experiences in transit. Migrants deployed humor to joke and laugh about particularly serious issues, including their illegality and immobility. By mocking INM agents and deriding the conditions of their journeys, migrants exercised a subtle but important form of resistance as well, which destabilized, if only temporarily, the political authority and legitimacy of immig immigration control in Mexico. More importantly, however, migrants' use of humor functioned as a mechanism to cope with their vulnerability, creating a shared sense of solidarity as they collectively joined together to joke and laugh about their journeys. Now these examples point to the significance of humor and the sites and spaces between origin and destination. As joking and laughter is key here to understanding migrants' identity and sense of belonging in transit. The use of humor also reveals the complexity of migrants' experiences along their journeys, which include violence, brutality, and insecurity, as I have described, but also joking and laughter. By ignoring these spaces of transit and these types of activities that take place within them, we deny migrants the right to a complex life, one that is saturated by tragedy, as well as a serious sense of humor. The significance of looking between places of origin and destination is also evident in sites of infrastructure, where migrants often develop intimate linkages to bridges and railways along their journeys. At times, bridges and railways represent sites of danger and vulnerability for migrants, while at other times, they symbolize hope and safety. As I demonstrate, this infrastructure, which is otherwise mundane, overlooked, and unremarkable, and migrants' attachments to it is key to understanding the contemporary politics of mobility and the ways migrants make sense of their journeys. You can have seconds too, if you'd like. <coughs> the white pickup truck sped down the highway, far exceeding the speed limit. Inside the truck bed, I held on tightly to my baseball cap as the dust and wind whipped up around me. Almost there, the investigator yelled, motioning to the small group of migrants seated on my right. They nodded silently, looking up ahead at the bridge coming into view. 
The truck bounced over a depression in the road and slowed to pull off onto a dirt trail. Edwin squinted at me in the blinding sunlight as he pointed to the immense concrete bridge in front of us. Underneath it was a pair of railroad tracks overspread with thick brush and scattered garbage. We drove another 50 yards before getting out of the pickup truck and walking to the bridge's entrance. The investigator approached Edwin with a clipboard and some paperwork. Tell me what happened, he ordered politely. I was walking alone here, Edwin explained, until I reached the top of that bridge, he said, gesturing toward the apex ahead of us. Then what happened next, the investigator asked. Edwin continued. Suddenly, I heard footsteps behind me, and when I looked, I saw a man in a ski mask approaching me with a machete. I turned to run, but I saw two more men waiting for me on the other end of the bridge. The investigator walked forward, tracing the steps Edwin had taken just weeks before. I thought they were going to kill me, Edwin explained, but instead, they took everything, even my shoes. They threw me to the ground, kicked me, hit me. One of them even had a baseball bat. I was trapped up here, alone. The investigator nodded as Edwin recounted the rest of the incident, common along this part of the migrant trail in southern Mexico. He tried to describe the men's appearances, but could not recall all of the details. Edwin was sure that they were from the local community. Looking off into the distance, Edwin appeared unsettled as he held on to the yellow railing in front of him. It's okay, the investigator interrupted. That's good enough. He collected his papers and headed for the white pickup truck. Descending from the bridge, I wiped the sweat from my brow as the group shared a bottle of water. Eventually, we filed back into the truck and sped off, searching for another overpass where two more migrants were assaulted. Bridges, like this one, are key sites along migrants' journeys. Primarily, bridges represent spaces of danger and vulnerability, where migrants are frequently subject to acts of violence, such as assault, robbery, and extortion. In transit, migrants utilize these bridges to navigate over railroad tracks, busy highways, and drainage canals. The architecture of bridges, however, elevated with only one entrance and one exit, bounded by railings and with a steep drop-off on either side, make natural choke points for local gangs and criminals, where migrants are easily entrapped. Mexican authorities, including INM agents and federal police, also make use of these physical features to apprehend, and in some cases, extort migrants. Typically, assailants will wait underneath or hide in thick underbrush nearby before attacking. By entering from both sides of the bridge, groups are able to ambush and encircle migrants trapped in the middle, shutting them off from escape. In this way, bridges are particularly hazardous for migrants who are vulnerable and exposed to attack when crossing them. On their journeys, migrants unsurprisingly forge intimate attachments to these bridges, forming linkages in transit and saturating this mundane infrastructure with meaning. For example, when speaking to Romeo, a young man from Honduras who was assaulted shortly after crossing the Mexico-Guatemala border, he described bridges as, power, as a powerful reminder of his vulnerability. I feel sick when I think about that bridge, he said. Every time I see a bridge like that, I feel sick, sick to my stomach, like I need to lay down again. You know, this happens to a lot of us out here. We disappear, we're robbed, and some are killed. It's terrible, but I guess I'm lucky. They left us alone, and thanks to God, we're still alive. For Romeo, then, bridges were symbolic of his and other migrants' vulnerability in transit. After his traumatic experience, he described how looking at other bridges made him sick, reminding him of the danger he, as well as other migrants, encountered on their journeys. Romeo's response also drew attention to his precarity as a migrant, where exposure to violence is not only common, but expected. In this series of events, Romeo developed a powerful attachment to bridges, which for him became widely symbolic of danger and vulnerability. Yet bridges also symbolized hope and refuge for migrants in transit. According to immigration law, migrants may use designated ports of entry, many of them located along large international bridges spanning the U.S.-Mexico border, to claim asylum in the United States. 
As migrants approach the border in northern Mexico near Texas, many utilize these bridges to enter U.S. territory and initiate the asylum process. For these migrants, bridges are important points of transition <coughs> as they leave Mexico behind and enter the U United States. In a conversation with Lucia, for example, a young asylum seeker from Guatemala, she highlighted the significance of bridges as spaces of hope and refuge for migrants. What did it feel like to reach the U.S.-Mexico border after traveling for so long, I asked her one morning. I was so relieved. I couldn't believe I had made it. It was tremendous. After nearly three months, I was almost there. In Reynosa, we could see the lights over the bridge. When I arrived that night and I saw them, I knew everything was going to be okay. I was going to make it. I'm finally safe. Here, Lucia's response indicated relief, drawing attention to the ways that bridges represented hope and refuge. Upon arriving in Reynosa at the U.S.-Mexico border and seeing the lights over the international bridge, Lucia explained that she knew everything was going to be okay and that she was going to make it after she described how she felt safe. In this way, Lucia developed a powerful attachment to bridges on her journey, which represented hope and refuge as she approached the U.S.-Mexico border. Railways are also important sites of infrastructure for migrants in transit. As I alluded to earlier, migrants have utilized large hazardous freight trains, colloquially known as the Beast, to travel across Mexico for some time. The trains, which extend far throughout the Mexican interior, deliver products such as grain and scrap metal north for export. Migrants previously rode atop these trains as they traveled, risking mutilation and dismemberment if thrown from the fast-moving cars, as well as other forms of violence at the hands of cartels and gangs that controlled the routes. Despite these risks, freight trains were a preferred method of transport for many migrants in transit carrying them to the U.S.-Mexico border in only a few days. More recently, however, the Mexican government has implemented strict measures to deter migrants from boarding the trains, primarily by expanding patrols and immigration checkpoints along railways and, surprisingly, ordering conductors to actually increase the train's speed in high-traffic areas as to throw migrants off of them. This strategy, while controversial, has been largely successful and migrants are now hesitant to use the trains for fear of deportation and or injury. Amidst these changes, railways have become symbolic of punishment and exclusion for migrants in transit, who encounter increasingly restrictive immigration controls along their journeys, as well as rising anti-immigrant sentiment in local towns and villages. For example, one morning, a group of migrants and I passed over a set of railroad tracks as we walked toward the town center. Five years ago, I rode this train to the border, one migrant said to me as he pointed to the railway beside us. Yeah, I responded. They tell me it's not so easy anymore. Another migrant behind us started laughing. Yeah, no shit. I tried a few months ago and they arrested me. The other migrants laughed alongside him. He continued. Seriously, Mexico is no longer a place for migrants. They don't want us here and they'll do whatever they can to stop us. The train is just one example they hunt us like animals. The others in the group nodded their heads in agreement, looking off at the empty railroad tracks as we continued walking. In this exchange, railways provoked a charged discussion about exclusion and recent immigration enforcement in Mexico, drawing attention to the ways they were, quote, hunted like animals, end quote, and how the government would do whatever it could to prevent migrants from crossing. As just one example, the railway was also tied to wider policies and restrictive immigration control. Thus, for these migrants, railways became key sites that symbolized punishment and exclusion for them. Despite this, railways also represent safety and security for migrants. Many, for example, still depend on the railways for navigation along their journeys across Mexico. Migrants frequently travel alongside the tracks in small groups, carefully following them northward. Utilizing a variety of routes and train depots throughout Mexico, migrants eat, sleep, and socialize in close proximity to the railways, relying on the tracks for direction and community in transit. <clears throat> 
Such intimate connections to railways were evident in a conversation with Arvin, a middle-aged man from Honduras traveling with his cousin and nephew. What route did you take to get here? I asked him one afternoon in the shelter. I don't know. We followed the railroad tracks, he exclaimed. We just started walking, following the tracks north, almost like a guide. Someone told us about the shelter here, so we decided to stop. We knew if we followed the tracks, we'd be safe. We'd eventually make it. You know, they all go in the same direction, north. For Arvin, railways symbolized safety and security in transit. As he explained, the railroad tracks functioned much like a guide, pointing Arvin and his group in the correct direction. In this way, the tracks represented a sense of security, knowing that if they followed them north, they would eventually make it. Throughout these examples, then, migrants developed powerful and intimate linkages to bridges and railways, at times symbolizing danger and vulnerability, while at other times hope and safety. This infrastructure, again, otherwise mundane, overlooked, and unremarkable, as well as migrants' attachments to it, underscores the contentious politics of contemporary mobility and migration, as well as the fractured experiences migrants encounter in transit. And these insights are key in understanding not only how migrants make sense of their journeys, uh, including the intimate attachments to places and infrastructure forged along the way, but also their identity and sense of belonging. So as I wrap up my talk this afternoon, what have I tried to show you today? Well, first, spaces of transit and the places between origin and destination are of crucial importance in making sense of international migration, especially as it becomes increasingly fragmented and dangerous, not just in North and Central America, as I have described, but worldwide. Second, Focusing on the act of transit itself and the spaces between origin and destination can tell us much about migrants' mobility, identity, and sense of belonging. And here I have shared just a few insights from coping strategies and solidarity forged through humor to the intimate attachments migrants develop to place and infrastructure in transit. <clears throat> Looking between, then, is key to understanding the lived realities and contemporary dynamics of international migration. This changes not only our object of analysis, but also where we look. In the process, both the content and politics of our findings change in ways we are only just beginning to acknowledge. Thank you. <laughs>